The end of the world. What about it? All generations had stories of existential threat. Stories that they told about Ragnarok, Armageddon. Uh, the Aztecs predicted their own end, uh, supposedly. The Mayans. Stories of existential threat that dealt with the end of everything they held dear. Human beings live a tentative life. We worry about possible dangers to our children, to our town, to our nation, to ourselves. And so these manifest in grander notions of how it all might end. The uh, next novel I'm writing right now is entitled Existence. And it deals with a lot of these threats, both the ones from the past that were cultural, worthy of some respect, that were silly, the ones of today that are either fascinating and daunting or silly. And in the novel, which includes a, the, an alien contact scenario that you've never seen before, the characters deal with a lot of these issues and how we might systematically become people better able to protect our existence. Well, the reason why I think about such things is obvious. I'm a child of the 50s and 60s. I used to dive under desks whenever the teacher said drop. Uh, we had those exercises all in fear of the, mushroom, the flash and the mushroom cloud on the horizon. My novel Earth deals with some of these issues of existence, survival, sustainability of our planet. These topics range from silly to dauntingly plausible. The life about the Lifeboat Foundation, of which I'm a director, has asked me to give a little riff about what they do, and that is to try to catalog potential risks, not to individuals, not even to nations, but to all of humanity and our planet, and look ahead to those that might loom on the horizon. They were the first, for example, to mention nanotechnology just after uh, Greg Bear coined the term gray goo, and before Michael Crichton made a very silly novel about it. So what are the silly notions, and what are plausible? Well, you know, we can talk about 2012, uh, as if the Mayans aren't themselves saying, that's ridiculous, it's not what they predicted at all. The cults, well, cults have erupted almost every year. Uh, for the last 2,000 years, whenever the calendar looked weird, or whenever some numerological thing added up, or when a comet appeared in the sky. Just over our hill, where I live, helicopters buzzed this mansion uh, in the neighboring rich community 24 hours a day for days and days when the Heaven's Gate cult killed themselves because Comet Kahootek was supposedly escorting a flying saucer in to take their souls away. Since my doctoral dissertation was about comets, and I've spent my life writing about aliens, I really felt bad that I didn't know they were there. I would have knocked on the door and straightened them out about a bunch of things. There are all these stories uh, circulating. The biggest one that has circulated for 2,000 years has been the book of Revelations. One can talk about how every generation has assigned the figures of their time to all the roles in the book of Revelation. The Confederate South assigned Abraham Lincoln the role of the beast. Northerners assigned to Jefferson Davis. There was a famous book in the uh, 1790s that assigned perfectly all the roles in the book of Revelations to Napoleonic era figures. But I don't have to go into that the simplest refutation of the book of Revelations is to be found in the book of Jonah. But these things are to be found in all cultures. What we're dealing with here is the problem of how we might harm the world, harm ourselves, or the universe might take it upon itself to harm us. A nearby uh, gamma ray burst, a supernova, uh, a misguided comet, uh, the mushroom clouds, a planet that's damaged by our own excesses. These are all issues 
that have to be taken very seriously and have been taken seriously on the pages of good science fiction. Uh, many, many millions of people were converted to the beginnings of the environmental movement by the movie Soylent Green, which was based upon Harry Harrison's wonderful book, Make Room, Make Room. Uh, tyranny. Tyrannies are notorious for making the stupid mistakes that lead to their own destruction. Democracies are far better at avoiding calamity, which is a very strong pragmatic reason for maintaining a world that's filled with light, openness, democracy, as I describe in my book, The Transparent Society. I mention that because George Orwell's 1984 was just like Soylent Green. It recruited millions of people to fight harder against tyranny, not only because it's bad and cruel, but because tyrannies make more mistakes. And so did Dr. Strangelove and On the Beach, which recruited more people to think about the dangers of accidental nuclear war. It is this notion of pondering these things in advance that the Lifeboat Foundation is about and that I, in my fiction and nonfiction, very often return to. And there is one contextual way of looking at these existential threats. It is something called the Fermi Paradox. Enrico Fermi, famously after World War II, uh, was listening to his students talk about the possibility of contact with alien life. And he said, so where are they? It's been billions of years. Not only where are their radio messages, where are their ships, but where is any sign that they ever visited the Earth during two billion years when the Earth was prime real estate? It's a daunting question. My friends in the SETI program, which, by the way, I support vigorously, I think we need to find out everything we can about the universe. And listening is the best way to do that. If you're the young orphan wandering around a mysterious and dauntingly silent jungle, listening is a good idea. My friends in the SETI community have failed to find the garish, goody-two-shoes, wonderful tutorial beacons that Carl Sagan predicted. Uh, blaring out, saying, younger races, here's your help, here's your help, here's your help. Notice how the theme is the same as it used to be. Help from above to overcome our mistakes. Well, they failed to find these tutorial beacons, and so the Fermi Paradox still hangs above us. I call it the Great Silence. Well, that doesn't mean that Seti's hopeless. There are many, many other possible cultures that Seti might find, and I wish them luck, and I'm hoping that they succeed. But meanwhile, the daunting notion of this silence implies that something is cutting down the numbers from Carl Sagan's and Frank Drake's optimistic notions of a cosmos filled with altruistic, wonderful uh, technological species all communicating like that. Either they aren't out there as much as we thought, by orders of magnitude, or they're keeping silent, perhaps because they know something we don't know. Either way, it leads to the question, is there some filter, as Nick Bostrom puts it, that reduces the numbers from, fair, from the uh, Drake equation, reducing the number of life worlds or the likelihood of life evolving, or the likelihood of advanced technological species surviving long enough to be noticeable? It's a fascinating question. It's an important question, and it's part of this new, new science of risk analysis. The analysis of risks that are low probability, but extremely high impact. And the lesson that we're learning from this, the lesson of maturity for science and for the public is, explore them all. Ignore none of them. Analyze them and discuss them. But also don't overreact. Don't huddle. Don't hide. Don't stop moving forward.